a phone call is user-generated content. Okay? A telephone network is the perfect example of the long tail. In other words, uh, things generated in vast quantities, often of interest to a remarkably small audience, um, but actually taking place at uh, an inordinate breadth. Most phone calls are sensationally dull to all but, you know, most, not all, I'm sure there's some very exciting phone calls to eavesdrop on, but most of them are sensationally dull to all but the intended recipient, practically. So, for goodness sake, user-generated content is, is over a million years old. The mass media age is actually the anomaly in this equation. What I'd like to see is our business actually acknowledging this, that actually acknowledging there's something innate uh, about you, you know, the human urge to actually create content, to share it, to distribute it, and to understand that brands and their budgets have a fantastic and exciting role in encouraging it and actually benefiting from this. Now, I'm, I'm from a strange business. I mean, incidentally, by the way, I mean, our role in terms of helping monetize things and monetize innovation, Mark's comment about actually the consumption of mobile TV, where most of it's actually at home, interests me a great deal. Uh, first of all, people are watching it on a tiny screen rather than on the high-definition screen next door. That actually um, coheres beautifully with what a friend of mine calls McDonald's Law, which is that all consumers at any time will always sacrifice quality for convenience. You know, do you want to go to the fat duck at Bray this evening? No, they haven't got a drive through window. Actually, extraordinarily, people will sacrifice, you know, a big screen for a tiny one for the advantage of watching something on the lavatory. Now, my hunch is that a huge amount of this is actually being consumed on the lavatory. And what, what I intend to do when I get back is get in touch with the uh, Unilever's Household Cleaning Products Division to suggest they shift a considerable amount of their budget onto mobile TV. So in that way, we can kind of monetize this stuff. But I come from... I come from I come from a very, deodorants would be good, wouldn't they? But actually, I come from a very peculiar business because we've been talking earlier about innovation at the speed of life, which I think is a great phrase, so long as you acknowledge that life doesn't always want to speed up. Sometimes it wants to actually stop, take stock, even go backwards sometimes. There's a lovely advertising story about Woody Allen, and they wanted him to do a, um, to make a TV commercial, effectively, and they wanted him to direct it. And interestingly, um, they, you know, his agent goes to him and says, Woody, there's an Italian brand. They want you to direct a TV commercial. He says, I'm not really interested. The agent says, they're offering you a million dollars, Woody. He said, I've already got one of those. <laughs> now, we're coming from the... Most of us operate on the basis, unlike Woody Allen, that it's axiomatic that more money is better. Woody is looking at it from the position of, actually, I've already got enough. Now, at what point does this equation actually apply to bandwidth? Is there some point at which actually, you know, bandwidth either becomes so commoditized or indeed so wastefully used that it becomes given away with petrol? This strikes me as a terrifying prospect. As a marketer, one of the things that pains me most is that the most exciting thing that happened in my entire lifetime is now advertised as something you get free with satellite television. What quadruple play, worryingly, seems to mean to consumers is that if I get four things, two of them will come free. Strangely, it doesn't mean you know, the great benefits of convergence, etc. It means it's a bog off for technology, effectively, a glorified kind of freebie. This terrifies me. I wake up every morning, Sky is advertising, if you have a £15 Sky package, your broadband comes for free. That seems to be completely the wrong way around. But it's interesting how every single player in this kind of business assumes that their core business is the valuable one that people want to pay for, and the other stuff is what's thrown in free. You, know, you can imagine Vodafone would come at it from a slightly different direction. Pay for a mobile phone subscription and your TV comes free, etc. That terrifies me because one of the things I love to see is that, you know, that things that truly are valuable and life-transforming are actually valued. And it really worries me the extent to which this sort of overabundance of bandwidth may actually almost cause the opposite effect that would I, which I like to see. There's a great writer who said that you know, mankind is suffering not from a want of wonders, but from a want of wonder. And the rapid sort of commoditization and, yeah, well, of course, ification of this kind of thing does genuinely kind of upset me, in a way. I don't know if it's avoidable, but it still upsets me. Anyway, I come at this slightly by accident because my brother's an academic, so I ended up first using the internet in 1988, unfeasibly early. And then when I started working in advertising later, it occurred to me that this was an extraordinary, um, had an extraordinary potential to be used in marketing if only someone would do something about it. And nobody did until about 1994, 1995, which I still think is probably the most important event or one of the perhaps two most important changes that any of us will see in our lifetimes 
in terms of a fundamental shift, a fundamental change. Now, this is an extraordinary thing for the advertising industry because the advertising industry, I once said, somebody asked me if, they'd, if I'd like to write a, a, um, a magazine article about changes in the advertising and marketing industries. And I said, I wouldn't mind, I said, but generally I preferred to concentrate on things like plate tectonics, where the pace of change is so much racier and more exciting. You know, it, it has been an astonishingly glacial business for very many years. It, it's almost kind of, you know, it, it's kind of innovation at the speed of molasses would be the kind of uh, phrase you'd actually use. And the reason for that is that truly, I mean genuinely, from the mid-50s with the advent of commercial television to the advent of the internet, nothing happened. Pretty much nothing happened. Suddenly they started making TV commercials in colour which I don't imagine, you know, occasioned a huge amount of sort of breast beating and, 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 and sort of head scratching. Shall we make the commercials in colour now? Yes. That was probably about as far as the discussion went. <laughs> now, interestingly, what has happened because the advertising industries have, you know, in a sense been allowed to, you know, stagnate is an unfair word, create an astounding amount of creativity but a remarkably small amount of innovation is probably the, the, the fair way to describe it. Very, very rich in creativity, very, very na you know, narrow in, in, in innovation. Um, because this has happened, what's happened is a certain sort of um, uh, a, a kind of arthritis has come into the business. It's become extremely dependent on certain metrics, for example. Now, because it came from the age of push, where you determined with your budget the nature and size of your audience, and then separately went and created messages for those audiences which you hoped would actually encourage the desired reaction. Because of that, it's become overly obsessed, I would argue, with the business of reach. Now, the internet comes along, new technologies come along, which actually operate in, in some ways in the opposite direction to mass broadcast. And actually, what may be far more important than reach may be something like relevance, timeliness, engagement, interest, utility. But we don't have numbers for all of those. So people are obsessed with reaching a very large audience simultaneously, simply because that was what mass media allowed them to do. Anyway, my hunch, I come from a company founded by David Ogilvy, famous really for producing a series of extraordinarily urbane advertisements for generally upmarket, fairly anglophile brands in the US in the mid-50s, which typically appeal to the kind of, uh, the Eisenhower era of kind of country club Republicans, is perhaps one way of describing them. That, you know, brands were typically things like Shell, premium whiskies, the English tourist board, Rolls-Royce, the famous advertisement of, um, at 60 miles an hour, the loudest sound in the new Rolls-Royce is the ticking of the electric clock, which is one of David Ogilvy's, and perhaps the ad that almost, you know, made him. It's, a, you know, one of the, arguably the most famous press ad ever written. And we always like to think as Ogilvy that the thing that had made this possible and the thing that enabled Ogilvy to create these extraordinary upmarket brands was pure creative brilliance, and to a degree it was. But equally, the creation of these upmarket and aspirational brands was actually the product of a change in the media environment. In this case, it was the arrival of upmarket, very, very high production value, aspirational color magazines that would actually sit on the coffee tables of country club Republicans and display for all visitors their taste, discernment, and sophistication. And suddenly, before that, you typically had newspapers which tended to encourage kind of retail-y, kind of short-term, kind of price-driven stuff. And you had radio, which was generally in the US relatively down market. You didn't have TV at that stage. The creation of this kind of medium and these print technologies made possible the creation and promotion of a new kind of brand. It was something upmarket, highly aspirational, and something that allowed you to project your own newfound prosperity and sophistication to other Americans of the same generation. Now, the vital thing, I think, for us to ask is, and, and for us to understand is that new media make possible a different kind of brand. And so the question I'm asking, just as BT are asking the question of what is a 21st century network, the question we've got to ask is what's a 21st century brand? I don't know the exact answer to that, but I've got a few clues, and it actually coheres very, very nicely exactly with what Mark was saying beforehand. Well, I, occasionally, I do what I call a history of advertising in the... 20th century in three punctuation marks. And it starts with an exclamation mark, the second one's a colon, and the third one's a question mark. The, the early days of advertising were all about assertion, an example of that being Persil washes whiter. You had a unique, a USP, a product claim, and you went out and you thrust it down people's throats with great repetition in the hope that it rubbed off. Now, we mustn't be totally dismissive of this because it worked to an extraordinary degree for a time. Later came a kind of burn-back creative revolution of the 60s, 
where they realize that a degree of engagement and read a contribution to an ad, a degree of decoding and involvement, actually help the communication of the message. And that's what I call the colon, that actually what you were quite clever to do is you weren't totally explicit in what you wanted to say, you actually did it as much almost by implication and allowed the consumer to do it by inference, rather than being completely, um, you know, kind of completely obtuse about the whole thing. You know, you, you'd position your brand as upmarket by, if you like, using codes and and suggestion and implication, rather than merely saying, you know, uh, as you would have done in, say, 1910, extremely rich aristocratic person uses this soap, you know. Now, the third phase is what I call the question mark phase, which is actually as much about involvement and engagement in communities as it is about actually saying anything at all. You maybe, you almost play the role of kind of like Jay Gatsby, who never turned up at his own parties. You host something, you encourage discussion, you prompt, you know, certain, what I might call missions, but you don't actually, you don't actually drive it too, you know, drive it too hard. Now, an example of this is Persil, which for years and years, it's known as OMO in different markets, just to explain, it's Persil to a British audience. Persil, not one of our brands, one of J. Walter Thompson's, for years and years had Persil washes whiter. Their new line of the last five years is Dirt is Good. And what it actually embraces is instead of embracing a product benefit, it actually embraces an attitude in particular to parenting. Incidentally, it plays very badly in Japan, where the concept is entirely alien. I'll come on to a little, a little bit of this more. But the basic thing is what you suddenly do is you're no longer defining your target audience by how upmarket they are or how downmarket they are or by demographic or any of this stuff. I'm very, very uncomfortable with demographics generally because I think they're outmoded and outdated. If you look at most of the successful brands of the last 10 to 20 years, they're successful actually because they defy demographics, not because they conform to them. The number of really good brands nowadays, you know, okay, Bollinger Champagne is probably an A. Uh, beer consumption by volume is probably young males to an extent. You know, they're, they're, I'm, not, I'm not totally dismissing the thing. But go on an easy jet flight, quite often you'll find a more upmarket uh, bunch of passengers than you'll find on British Airways. The reason is that the people on EasyJet own the houses that the BA passengers aspire to rent, for example. Um, you know, the iPod is, is, is not seen as an upmarket or downmarket uh, thing. Tesco, the great success of that brand, is it defied up or down marketness and simply managed to create a brand that could actually cater for uh, you know, everything from Tesco's finest and kind of virtual deli customers to people who are genuinely cost constrained, on the other hand. What's brilliant about the Tesco brand, is, uh, and other, there are other brands that manage to do that, is they destigmatize low cost. Um, you know, in some sense, they're perhaps two, two core roles of advertising, one of which is to justify high costs, and the other one is to destigmatize low price. You know, so you know, that's an important kind of thing to understand. Increasingly, there are brands out there which, are, you know, which, which just defy demographics. And I think that's a very important thing to understand. The 21st century brand is not particularly about snobbery. It's much more about attitude or interest group uh, than it is about anything else. And what it seems to me, and this seems doubly true when you talk about media brands, if you look at the media environment, it always seems to me that those media whose audiences share an interest or an attitude are actually doing fine. You know, Channel 4, which understands its viewers extraordinarily well, is actually doing great. Not a problem. Channel 5 is actually pretty smart. Magazines are doing extraordinarily well. Special interest magazines are doing wonderfully well. The internet, obviously, is the ultimate uh, special interest uh, medium in many respects. Actually, they're not having a problem. When you actually understand, you know, the three newspapers which understand their readership, they're used as, you know, in some, in some cases they're used as stereotypes. Typical Sun reader, typical Guardian reader, typical male reader. Now, you may not like those three newspapers, but it seems to me that they've actually got, you know, they, they actually have a robust role in the future because they actually tap not into a kind of distribution play or a demographic play. They actually have an audience which they understand, and they actually play a role in the part of that community of readers. Millwall has a fantastic, I always think, has the greatest single uh, advertising line of any community brand, which is, no one likes us, we don't care. The line of Millwall Football Club. Now, that's an extraordinarily potent thought in many ways, if you're a community. Because actually it's, you know, if you're talking about loyalty and kind of, uh, you know, inner strength of a community, the resistance to outside persecution and dislike is a wonderful, I think it, it's actually St. Paul who talked about this, the salt of persecution is actually a preservative. Anyway, now I'm talking about this community thing. Now, for goodness sake, don't think this is weird. I mean, people talking to each other, user-generated content, communities forming, that is a million years old and more, okay? 
A conversation around a pub is user-generated content. If you look at the poet Homer, which is about 2,500, 2,800 years old, Homer was basically a mash. He took the work of other poets and apparently merged it together into a cohesive whole. So he was doing exactly the kind of thing that's you know, being done by people with you know, taking, making their own Star Wars movies and goodness knows what else. Interestingly also, and I always think this sort of thing, he was allegedly blind. Now, being blind 2,800 years ago, I would suspect is the equivalent of actually being a student now. In other words, you're time rich and cash poor. So it'll be interesting to see, you know, the possibility of symbiotic relationships between brands that have money and students who have talent and time and other people of that kind, and the possibilities of them actually reaching an accommodation well, all I'm saying is it's 2,800 years old. Don't think of this as weird. The mass media age was really weird. That was completely anomalous. The extent to which, if you want... Now, no one nowadays... There was a period of about 100 years, if you wanted to take over a country, you took over the TV station. Earlier, it was the radio station. And that's how you held a revolution. You put out a few messages. Everybody said, my God, the government's changed. And a few people turned up and stormed the presidential palace, OK? Now, you couldn't do that now. I mean, which TV station would you choose? And what if you went and stormed the studios of QVC? You'd end, up with five, you'd end up with 500 people wandering around the presidential palace looking for collectible China. It's not a, you know, it's not a great thing to actually... Now, interestingly, there have been two revolutions, one, I think, in the Philippines and one, in, arguably, in Spain, where at least the, the, the result of a general election was changed, which were prompted by text message. Revolutions nowadays happen by text message. That is a fundamental change which advertisers who are used to actually, to some extent, using their budgets to control the TV stations need to come to terms with. I mentioned that the 21st century brand is not about demographics. Uh, I said that brands, and media brands in particular, need to revolve around an interest, an attitude, a mission, rather than boastful statements of superiority. I think this is an important thing. I also have a belief that if brands can possibly acquire an ideal rather than just an idea, they have a fundamental advantage. The reason I say this is that we don't actually know what the media future is going to bring. It's woefully uncertain and strange. What I do seem to see is that organizations that are mission-driven, that want to achieve something, actually are fine. Now, that's the 21st century brand, not about, not about you know, reach, much more about you know, perhaps relevance, much more about timeliness, much more about understanding communities and their needs than anything else. And the, thing, the reason this terrifies me is that um, we've got a few people from New Zealand here, and my, one of my colleagues is a New Zealander, and I always tease him because he's a great cat hater. And the reason he hates cats is, being absolutely honest, the birds in New Zealand are crap. Okay, Because about, I don't know, 50, 100,000 years ago, having no predators, the birds decided in New Zealand, not a great long-term decision, that flight was optional. <laughs> okay, And actually, it was not necessary to be able to fly in order to qualify as a successful bird. <laughs> now, this wasn't a bad thing, because bear in mind, New Zealand was completely uninhabited until about the 13th century. And actually, indeed, not only was it uninhabited, but they had no predators, virtually. Then someone came along from the West and brought a cat. Now, you can imagine the reaction of New Zealand's first cats, can't you? This is a bit weird, isn't it? You know, funny sort of scenery. What's that bird doing? Oh, I suppose it'll just fly it. The birds here can't fly. Result! You know, <laughs> if a cat could have put a paw up, that would have been it. Now, the thing that terrifies me about that is I'm worried about brands that become like New Zealand bird life, which is that they have a wonderful existence in the 30-second TV ecosystem, but if that ecosystem is at all threatened, they've got no place to go. One of the vital things we must do with brands is continually experiment. And there's a very good article from uh, McKinsey Quarterly saying 20% of a marketing budget should now go into structured, intelligent experimentation to basically future-proof your brand, to make sure you've always got a plan B. Now, that sounds, you know, slightly sort of, you know, frightening. What's your plan B? What's your exit strategy from TV? But then if you look at the performance of ITV recently, maybe you wouldn't have been so, so daft to have started experimenting, you know, four or five years ago. So that's a vital thing. Future-proofing brands is absolutely and vitally important. Now, the other thing I don't want to happen is we don't know what's going to happen in many respects. You know, we need to actually test and plan for an uncertain future. But don't get too freaked, in a sense. That's my other thing, which is that I believe genuinely that in media and communication terms, the most important two changes that any of us will see in our lifetime have already happened. In other words, it was effectively the peer-to-peer -peer and internet revolution that was everything. Everything else we've done since, and everything else we'll probably do for another 50 years, is actually just polyfilling. It's filling in potential gaps. It's enhancement. But conceptually, I'm not sure we'll see anything actually new. There's a third possibility, which I'll come to, but it's in sense attached to the other two. 
The two things that really happened that were extraordinary, one, actually consumers could, watch, could consume information on their own terms and on their own time scale. That was completely unheard of beforehand. The assumption was we broadcast, they then selected from a limited choice and watched what was going. Suddenly you had people who could decide what information they wanted and when they wanted to consume it. Now the reason that's vital, I think, is that one of the things that current advertising metrics simply don't understand is the importance of timeliness in targeting. They're very keen on defining audiences by who they are. But when they are, is completely overlooked. And no one has yet found a way of putting a value on timely communication as opposed to well-targeted communication. Now, I'll give you an example. I have, on average, about a seven-minute window every month when I'm actually interested in my finances. Okay? The rest of the time, I really don't give a damn. Now, in the old days, they sent me a bank statement. The bank statement never arrived during that seven-minute window. I put it on the shelf. Eventually, I threw it away unread because I figured it was probably old enough that I could safely throw it away. That was about it. Now, suddenly, when that seven-minute window strikes, which may be at one o'clock on a Saturday morning, in fact, it probably is, I go in, I go online, I look at my bank balance, I move a bit of money here, I move a bit of money there, and I request a checkbook, and off I go. Now, what was once, you know, an apparently well-targeted thing, and the, you know, the, the, my bank statement was actually extraordinarily well-targeted, very personalized, and with amazingly individualized information, it just arrived at the wrong moment. If you look at a Google, I have no interest in or liking for French antique reproduction furniture, okay? I probably, if I can possibly help it, will never spend any money on it in my life. But let's say a friend of mine has a 60th wedding anniversary and his greatest love in life is French reproduction antique furniture. It's unlikely, but it's always possible. If suddenly I have to go online to discover a bit more about it, Google will know that I'm suddenly in the market for this stuff within 0.0004 seconds. That is an extraordinary thing. The ability to reach people relevantly by moment. The other thing we need to understand is that defining audiences by you know, who they are and their likelihood to buy is only one thing. We need to define audiences by influence. There are people who have an extraordinary influence on the marketplace who may actually have a remarkably low value. That's one of the interesting things. That value, and actual, value knowledge, and influence don't always correlate. So we, we need to target influence. In some ways, PR agencies do this in a limited extent. But online, within communities, uh, I know someone who runs a company called Live World, and he can tell you the names of the 15 people on the online 24 community who basically sway the whole thing. 15 kind of 24 alpha males who basically determine the, you know, the pattern of, of uh, uh, reaction to everybody else. Now, I, I mentioned the, you know, the two changes. The one one is that business that actually people consume information on their own terms. That means, for example, that the size of your audience is not actually necessarily determined by the size of your budget. In fact, they can be inverse. Viral is an attempt to actually garner um, an audience through interest alone. That's fascinating in itself. So actually, the old assumption that 85% of your communication budget went to Rupert Murdoch for distribution and 15% of it went to uh, you know, an agency for content creation, that ratio is completely up for grabs. You can make the case that actually the nature of your creative determines the nature and size of your audience more than your media budget and your media buy does in certain online spaces. The other thing that's inadequately asked is the question of if we segment our audience, everybody asked who is likely to buy and they then give them an age and demographic pattern. If you launch a new Ford Mondeo, 50% of the buyers from that car will be owners or drivers of the old Ford Mondeo. Typically, they'll have an old Ford Mondeo that's three to four years old. Now, my hunch is, and I think this is a reasonable assumption based on all the cars I've owned, is that actually, if I've got a three-year-old Ford Mondeo and I'm thinking of buying the new one, I don't want 30 seconds worth of information. I'd be actually happy with 30 minutes worth. Yet, weirdly, those people who constitute perhaps half of the purchases of the new Mondeo are forced to make do with the same 30 seconds that everybody else has. Incidentally, there are huge audiences out there who might be happy with naught seconds. Another thing. So it just forces us to ask questions, what is an audience? I've just said as an experiment, there's no right answer, by the way, but let's just experiment with defining your brand's audience in lots of different ways and see what comes up. For American Express, I've tried to define the audience as anybody with a Blackberry, I believe, should have an American Express card. Now, if you define your audience that way, you'll come up with some interesting ideas. If you define your audience as uh, demographically, you'll end up doing TV. By the way, there's nothing wrong with doing TV. Perfectly cool to put all your money on TV so long as you've considered the alternatives first. And my beef with the big, you know, what you might call the TV industrial complex is a lot of the money spent is spent by people who haven't really considered the alternatives because the audience has been defined demographically. The cheapest way to reach a demographic is TV. Whoops. Surprise, surprise, you're on TV. Now, 
But it's something to be very, very alert to, the self-fulfilling prophecy that goes on there. Now, the first change then is people consume on their own terms. And actually, how you target them by moment, by interest, or whatever, you may be actually, you know, your brand maybe should be about an interest rather than, you know, demographics I mentioned. The second thing is this peer-to-peer -peer explosion I mentioned earlier, that actually the Mentos explosion is caused entirely by user-generated content resulting from their exposure and explosion in Coke. BT, actually, one of my phrases is don't try and be a brand architect anymore, be a brand builder's merchant. Actually, go out and create tools that people can use to build your brand for you. Provide them with the building materials. BT did an extraordinary thing, which I think was one of the most brilliant marketing ideas, to promote spoken text, the, um, the, the text-to-speech functionality. They went in and got Tom Baker in to do it. What you may not know, go to a website called the Dr. Sings or the Dr. Talks.co.uk, and a guy out there went and produced karaoke versions of The House of the Rising Sun using text messages of the lyrics sent to the BT text-to-voice service. The extraordinary thing about them is they're brilliant. If I get a chance, I'll actually download them and play them or email them for someone to be played tomorrow. That's a case of being a brand builder's merchant. You provide half the tools, the voice of Tom Baker in text. Admittedly, the chap spent some time making him utter obscenities as well, but that's to be expected. All new and innovative things start somewhere smutty. So, I've mentioned this. I think I, Now, what you ultimately have, whether it's peer-to-peer, -peer, now, the peer-to-peer -peer revolution is very simply put, you, if you go and stand in the middle of a field, you have more peer-to-peer -peer communicating power now than JFK had in the middle of the Cuban Missile Crisis. The alarming thing is that when JFK was negotiating with the Russians over the Cuban Missile Crisis, the communication back to Moscow involved the White House calling Western Union, at which point a bloke arrived on a pedal bicycle who picked up the message, cycled it over to the Russian embassy, who then broadcast that back to Moscow. Now, when the entire future of the world is at stake, you've got a bloke on a bike, okay? And that's, that's within some of our lifetimes, pretty much. That is an extraordinary thing if you can now stand in the middle of the field and you can actually send picture messages to someone in Latvia. You know, in that short period, the potency of being able to generate rich content and be able to actually disseminate it has just been transformed. What I'm saying again is this isn't a new thing. It's actually a reversion to basic human type. We like communicating with each other. Now, the final little thing, I suppose, is... When you have a consumer who is now in control, whether we like it or not, I personally kind of like it, although it scares me, because I no longer have a budget to relax. Perhaps what I feel is that the job of brands, uh, the job of advertising agencies is perhaps different. Perhaps my job is no longer to create fantastic content, which I then attach to a brand. Maybe my job is to go out there and find fantastic content and attach the brand to it. Maybe the whole thing is to do it backwards, to find what's extraordinary out there and brand it. Now, what sort of things are these things? Not just media. When the consumer's king, there are three possible roles for the brand, okay, or, or for a piece of communication that will earn that piece of communication a role in the person's life, voluntarily, of their own will. They all begin with court. Court jester, courtier, courtesan. Basically, be very, very funny, be very, very useful, or be very, very sexy. Those are the three things that actually earn you a role in the court of the new consumer. And any of those three things are okay. The one I think is neglected is actually the courtier role. Be very, very useful. I think, you know, ad agencies know how to do sexy. They know how to do kind of, um, you know, they're quite, quite good at entertainment. What I want to see mar far far more of is branded utility. Provide an essentially fantastically useful service to consumers and put your brand on it. It drives me apoplectic that I cannot pay for car parking at stations using SMS. Create this service, seed this service, put the Cisco brand on it. Actually, you know, perfectly valid thing. Now, is this difficult to do? And my answer is actually no, it isn't difficult to do. Because what I do, what I believe in doing, is I think innovation, to some extent, focuses too far on the actual leading, bleeding edge. And the thing I'm trying to foster is a culture of what I call unovation which isn't actually pure innovation. It's actually taking relatively old established technologies and looking at all the, th all the, at all the things we never got around to doing because we'd moved on to the next thing by the time they'd become unfashionable. I mean, what are the extraordinary things you can do with text? You know, there are a thousand things you could do with text which no one has actually made possible. Or when they do make them available, they don't promote them. There used to be a text service using geographical location called Good Pub. And you used to text the Good Pub word to 85130 and it would text you back the address of the nearest pub uh, in the good pub guide. So you could have a text-enabled pub crawl. Now, it costs 50p, but that's better than spending an evening in a bad pub. 
Interestingly, if you texted next, it would then give you the next pub to go to, so you could keep on all evening. And uh, Nobody ever found out about this service at all. It was potentially for a Brit life transforming. <laughs> Completely unpromoted service. Now, innovation is one of the things I think brands can actually do. Is actually f Now, let me just explain what I'm saying about innovation. And it's my last little challenge. I'll be very, very quick to wrap up. But marketers and, and engineers both have actually quite similar faults, I think, which is the lack of a sense of proportion. But the final thing, the, and actually good creative people, you almost look for it in them as a, as a mark. So, you know, it's, 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 it's obviously one of those things that's both a failing and a strength. I was asking an interesting question about, the, to some extent, some innovation that is neither nice Kaizen incremental improvement nor revolutionary. How much money are we spending on stuff that's neither one thing nor the other? And I'll give you the example of the Eurostar, okay? They had a budget of six billion to improve the Eurostar service from London to Paris. And they decided to spend it on new tracks and a faster service, which knocked 33 minutes or something off the journey time, okay? Now, I'm a marketer, I, you know, I'm not an engineer, okay? But call me Mr. Picky, but isn't there a better way to spend six billion pounds than that? Now, don't get me wrong, if you can invent teleportation and you can get me to Paris instantaneously, I'm interested in that, I'll buy. Equally, if the journey time was six hours, I think spending money getting it down to three so you can actually compete with airlines, good idea, do it as well. However, six billion to knock 35 minutes, which I'll only spend at a Parisian traffic jam anyway. Now, let's look at a few alternatives, shall we? One, you add Wi-Fi to the trains. That adds six productive hours to your day rather than just 40 minutes. Now, that's just a technical solution. I went to other people and marketers and said, what else would you do? And the best solution was this. They said, go and spend a billion pounds making sure that every single train journey on the Eurostar has supermodels handing out free Chateau Petrus 1945 for the entire duration of the journey. So, you'll still have five billion pounds left over in change, and people will ask you for the trains to be slowed down. <laughs>